I think I like it. We should look busy, Reed says suddenly, glancing over his shoulder. I follow his gaze, catching Deborah's eye. She smiles and waves, and I feel my cheeks go warm. Crap. Yeah, job. Work. We can rearrange stuff in the baby section again, Reed says. Okay. It's kind of like... He lowers his voice, glancing briefly at Deborah again. There's not always a lot to do here. I guess it depends on the day. Ah. I fall into step beside him, walking toward the baby section, which is essentially Pinterest come to life. The ceiling is draped with softly patterned pastel bunting, and there are hanging hot air balloon decorations, not for sale, and impossibly soft stuffed animals, for sale, and everything is organic. Reed turns to me suddenly. You're not going to quit, though, right? What? I shouldn't have said anything. About there not being a lot of work to do here? He bites his lip. I love not doing work, I assure him. And it's true. Not doing much work is my favorite thing. And my other favorite things include being around a lot of mason jars, rearranging table displays, and teasing geeky boys about their fondness for historical queens. Well, good. I smile. Otherwise, I was going to have to bribe you with mini eggs, he adds. Wait, really? Absolutely. Too late, though. That's a shame. I give him a glare, and his dimple flickers. And hey, looks like House Lannister Reed knows about jokes after all. Here's the funny part. All the way home, I replay this conversation with Reed in my head. I don't even realize I'm doing it until I arrive at my own doorstep. Admittedly, this is the kind of thing a person might do while establishing her 27th crush, hypothetically speaking. But Reed isn't a crush. I don't know how to explain it, but a crush is a very particular thing for me. Like crush number eight, Sean of the Eyelashes. It was the second to last night of camp, the summer after eighth grade, and it was raining, so we were all watching Wet Hot American Summer in the lodge. By coincidence, or fate, it felt like fate. Sean was sitting next to me. I found him massively cute, kind of short, with spiky dark hair and bright blue eyes, and the eyelashes. At least 75% of Sean's body weight was eyelashes. He was sitting in one of those folding nylon camp chairs, and at one point, he leaned toward me out of nowhere to say, This movie rules. I agreed with this statement. And at the time, that felt cosmically significant. I could barely catch my breath for the rest of the movie, and my heartbeat was probably making those gigantic zigzags. Literally all my mental energy was devoted to trying to come up with something clever and nonchalant to say to this boy. This perfect boy, whom I'd noticed around camp for weeks, who was now miraculously sitting beside me, and who had, even more miraculously, spoken to me first. But I was suddenly frozen and electrically self-conscious. My thighs felt enormous, and I was acutely aware of the waistband of my shorts digging into the fat on my stomach. It occurred to me that Sean, of course I already knew his name, wouldn't be talking to me if he knew about the shorts and the fat and the waistband. So I just stared at the movie screen, not really watching it. But when the movie was over, Sean nudged me and said, That was really cool, right? I smiled and nodded really fast. I never talked to him again. I haven't even thought about him in years. But as I climb the stairs to my bedroom, his face is vividly clear to me, and the mental image of him still makes my heart race. Molly Pascansuso, crushing on the memory of eighth grade boys. Am I the biggest creeper in the universe? Check yes or hell yes. I sink onto my bed. So there was Sean. And Julian Portillo, my friend Elena's older brother. Crush number 11, Julian of the experimental breakfasts. That's the main thing I remember. The way he used to make these very complicated gourmet breakfasts for us in the mornings after our sleepovers. I guess I found that really charming for some reason. Even though I am not a person who experiments with breakfast. Anyway, Julian was a senior when Elena and I were freshmen, 
and their parents were from El Salvador, and they both had giant dimples in both cheeks. Julian had a really loud laugh, too. I kept a diary back then, and I took note of every single time he spoke to me, which was rare. Mostly because I lost the ability to speak when he was around, and I guess cute senior boys don't like speaking to walls of awkward freshman silence. Anyway, Julian ended up at Georgetown, and Elena got a scholarship to private school, and neither of them is on Facebook, so I have no idea what they're up to now. Not a clue. But the point is, I can't talk to guys I like. Not really. My body completely betrays me. And it's a little different with every guy, so it's kind of hard to generalize. But if I had to describe the feeling of a crush, I'd say this. You just finished running a mile, and you have to throw up, and you're starving, but no food seems appealing, and your brain becomes fog, and you also have to pee. It's this close to intolerable. But I like it. More than like it. I crave it. Because there's nausea and fog, but there's also this... An unshakable feeling that something wonderful is about to happen. That's the part I can't explain. No matter how unlikely, I always have a secret shred of hope. And as feelings go, that's a pretty addictive one. Six. Cassie busts into my room at six in the morning without knocking. Yo, sleepyhead, where's your string ding? Olivia needs beat therapy. I blink up at her. Now? She's on her way over. Some kind of Evan douchery. Right. So here's a confession. I've never entirely understood the appeal of Evan Schulmeister. This is not just me being jealous that Olivia has a boyfriend. I think Evan's an acquired taste, but without the part where I actually acquire the taste. Should I get dressed? Cassie laughs. For Olivia? Pajamas it is. Twenty minutes later, we're cross-legged on the front porch, surrounded by magazines and scraps and scissors. I'm bleary-eyed, but it's cool and breezy and actually kind of nice. I think the whole neighborhood is still sleeping. So what did that dumb fuck do this time? Asked Cassie. He's not a dumb fuck. Olivia fidgets with a bead, tugging it up and along the string. This is a thing she and I have been working on for years our bead strings. Mine is over ten feet long now, maybe thousands of beads, and every single bead is homemade, cut from magazine pages. All you do is cut triangles out of paper and roll them tightly around a coffee straw, starting with a wide point. Seal it with glue and maybe a layer of clear nail polish. Then you slide them onto your string and repeat. Mine's kind of an ombre rainbow pattern, starting with red, but I've worked my way up through the indigo section almost ready for violet. When it's done, I'm going to line it along the top edge of my bedroom wall so it drapes down like lace. So, okay, this isn't even a big deal, Olivia says. It's just something he said that's kind of been bugging me. Not a big deal, Cassie asks. Olivia shrugs, smoothing glue over the end of a bead. Cassie grins. You texted me at 5.30 in the morning. Ugh, I'm sorry, I'm being ridiculous. Livy, you're not being ridiculous. Cassie scoots closer and hooks her arm around her. I just don't like seeing you sad. I'm not sad, I'm just... Olivia looks down at the finished bead nestled in the palm of her hand. That's really pretty, I say. Thanks, yeah. Anyway, it was just Evan being weird. He was asking me a bunch of questions about waxing. What? Like, Brazilian bikini waxing? Um, okay. Cassie raises her eyebrows. Yeah, it was out of nowhere, and he kept saying he was just curious about it, and I was finally like, are you trying to tell me something? She pauses to slide her bead onto her string. And he says, no, of course not, why do you think that? Cassie sighs. Jesus Christ, I don't know. Olivia smiles tightly. I really think he was just curious. Pretty sure he's trying to police your vagina. I mean, he didn't ask me to, like, get waxed. Cassie laughs. Uh, I'd say he hinted pretty strongly. Fuck that, though. That is so not his call. 
It occurs to me suddenly that I've been staring at the same magazine page for the last five minutes, and it's not even the right color scheme. I feel slightly on edge. I just honestly hate this kind of conversation. It's not that bikini waxing is a foreign concept to me, but, I mean, I guess it kind of is. Like, it's one of those girl habits that's so far beyond me, it makes me feel like a different species. Do boys require hairless vaginas? Is this a known thing? Of course, the magazine I'm holding makes me think so. Not that there's a big hairless vagina in my face, but it's one of those models with perfect shadowy cleavage. How do they get their cleavage to do that? I'm pretty sure I could drive a boat through my boobs, they're so far apart. I guess it's just this feeling that my body is secretly all wrong. Which means any guy who assumes I'm normal is going to flip his shit if we get to the point of nakedness. Whoa, nope, not what I signed up for. It makes me never want to be naked. And it's not like I could be a never nude. I don't even like jean shorts. Am I right? Cassie asks. I look up and realize they're both looking at me. Yes, I say, which is probably a safe answer. Cassie usually is right. Ah, uh, I don't know. Olivia shakes her head. Like, I don't even mind the idea of it or whatever. I just don't want it to be a thing. I hate confrontations. Uh, clearly. Olivia smiles shyly. What do you mean? Well, you just confirmed that you would literally rather get the hair ripped off of your vagina than deal with confrontation. Oh, she says. I guess so. That is... Nope, just give me your phone. Cassie makes a grab for it. Cassie? Are you texting him? I ask. I'm just letting him know. She starts typing. That Olivia would be happy to get waxed if he's willing to wax his tiny, microscopic little peen at the same time. What? Olivia makes a violent grab for the phone. Don't you dare hit send. Cassie leans back on her elbows, laughing. There's that fighting spirit. Fuck you, Olivia says, grinning down at her phone. Immediately, my phone buzzes in my pocket. Text from Olivia. Love my hairy vag. Vag for the win. Go wax your butthole, please, Schulmeister. I snicker, tilting my phone toward Olivia. Oops, I think this text was meant for Evan. Should I forward it to him? I hate you both, Olivia says, halfway between a laugh and a scowl. We burn out on beads after an hour or so. And by that, I mean Cassie burns out and starts dumping the magazines back into their reusable grocery bags. But I really think the bead therapy helped. By the time Olivia leaves, she's her unruffled self, even if the situation still has Cassie amped up. What was that about? Nadine asks when we walk into the living room. She's nursing Zave on the couch. Cassie sinks down beside her. You don't want to know. Is Olivia okay? I was just talking to her mama. Sounds like she's looking at art programs. That's definitely not what we were talking about, says Cassie. Evan's being a shitbag again, I say, and Cassie beams down at me like a proud parent. Must be the word shitbag. Cassie loves compound curse words. Schulmeister, Nadine says. What did that little fuckwipe do now? Come to think of it, Nadine loves compound curse words too. Cassie tells her the whole thing, and you can tell Nadine loves every moment of this. I don't think there's a single thing on earth that brings more joy to Nadine than throwing shade at Evan Schulmeister. She's never liked him. Ever since he asked if Cassie was actually queer, or if she was trying to emulate our moms. He actually used the word emulate. I don't even want to remember that particular stretch of awkward silence. Actually, I do. It was kind of amazing. But my mind keeps drifting back to the way I felt this morning on the porch. There's so much I don't know about. And everyone else seems like they were born knowing. Things like waxing and birth control. I know the mechanics, obviously, but how does it play out in real life? Who brings the condom? Can anyone buy condoms? Can you use the self-checkout U-scan so there's no eye contact involved? Except, oh God, what if the machine announces it? Condoms, $12.99. Please place your giant box of condoms in the bag. 
Oh, but your value pack of condoms is too big for our sensors. Please wait and someone will assist you shortly. Why are you so red, Momo? Nadine asks. Whoa, Molly, hey, get your shit together. I guess I shouldn't worry about this until I've actually, you know, kissed a guy. 7. On Wednesday, I somehow end up in the backseat of Mina's ancient but immaculate Lexus. I can't believe this is your car, Cassie says. I mean, it's so cool that you even have a car. It was my grandma's, says Mina. Our grandma's not supposed to drive anymore. Cassie says, because she hit someone. Mina gasps. Are you serious? Dead serious. I was with her. I mean, she was going really slowly and the guy was totally okay, but she cursed him out and called him a bitch. Mina laughs. I have to meet this woman. She's visiting next week, I say. You should come over. Okay, no, Cassie says. Mina does not need to meet Grandma. That is a solid nope. She grins, and I look at her, curled up in the passenger seat, her whole body turned toward Mina. She's like a flower tilting toward the sun. So, Molly, can I ask you something? Mina says, after a moment, eyes flicking up to meet mine in the rearview mirror. Sure. Cass says you've had crushes on 25 guys. 26, Cassie corrects immediately. But you haven't dated any of them? Mina asks. No, I say. I feel the usual prickle of self-consciousness. But when Mina glances at me again, her expression is sweetly curious. Is there a story behind that? There's no story. It just never... I lean back against the seat, squeezing my eyes shut. I have this sudden memory of middle school... There was this table of boys in the cafeteria who would yell, boy oing oing when hot girls walked by. Except when I walked by, they made a womp 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 sound, like a boner going limp. I remember feeling frozen. Cassie was screaming at them, and I couldn't catch my breath. I thought I was dying. My first panic attack. I mean, here's the thing I don't get. How do people come to expect that their crushes will be reciprocated? Like, how does that get to be your default assumption? Well, she doesn't put herself out there, Cassie says. Like, at all. So Molly's never actually been rejected either. And I'm okay with that, I say. Cassie snorts. I stare out the window. Bethesda looks so different from Tacoma Park. Everything's a little quieter and fancier, and there are definitely fewer mixed-media art installations in people's front yards. But it's nice here. Some of the houses are really, really big. Well, what kind of guys do you like? Mina says, slowing for a stop sign. Other than Will? Jesus Christ, hipster Will. I never actually said I liked him. I don't even know if I do. I've met him once. Oh, she likes all kinds of guys. Molly's a crush machine, Cassie says. Let's see, Noah Bates, Jacob Schneider, Jorge Gutierrez, that guy Brent from Hebrew school, the eyelash kid from camp, Josh Barker, Julian Portillo, the short guy from pre-calc, the student teacher, Vihan Gupta, and Olivia's little cousin. Okay, I did not know he was 13. Cassie grins. Oh, and Lin-Manuel Miranda, that's a major one. Oh, Really? Mina says, beaming at me in the mirror. Me too. Yeah, well, just so you know, he's Molly's currently reigning crush number 26, so this may end in a fight. I stretch forward to smack Cassie, maybe harder than I need to. Or a duel, she adds under her breath, and Mina bursts out laughing. I close my eyes again. Mina and Cassie are murmuring softly now, about something unrelated to my wasteland of a love life. So that's good. I let my mind wander, but it keeps snagging on a single point. Molly's never actually been rejected. I just hadn't really thought about it like that before. But it's true. I've never been rejected. Not directly. I've never given anyone the opportunity. I've never rejected anyone either. And maybe that's even weirder than the fact that I haven't kissed anyone. 
At the very least, I'm pretty sure these things are all related. Somehow. Cassie nudges me suddenly. Hey, we're here. I let my eyes slide open. Mina's house is brick and medium-sized, with a super gorgeous front yard. You can tell they planned in advance where the bushes would go. Mina parks in the driveway, and Cassie and I follow her down this little path to the front door. Her parents are at work. She slides a key into the lock. Immediate first impression? Everything in Mina's house looks like it's there on purpose. The walls are white, with framed family pictures placed almost symmetrically. The windows are huge and clean, so everything feels really sunny. Also, everywhere I look, there's art. Paintings and sculptures and even the light fixtures. Lots of animals, especially tigers. Some realistic, but mostly stylized. And it's the perfect mix of cute and badass. I kind of want to pin this whole house to my design board. A painting in the hallway catches my eye. Maybe my favorite one yet. Your parents must really love tigers, I say. Oh, that's like a Korean thing, Mina says. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Why are you sorry? Okay, this is really cute, Cassie interjects. She taps the edge of a canvas-wrapped photo of Mina hugging the life force out of some goat in a petting zoo. Oh, God, says Mina. I love it. Cassie steps closer, and then their fingertips almost touch. Not quite. Makes me wonder. Mina clears her throat. Um, so the boys are on their way, but we could head down to the basement. I'll leave the door open for them. The boys? She gives me this painfully knowing smile. Will and Max? Oh, I blush. We follow Mina downstairs. The basement is enormous. I don't think Tacoma Park has basements like this. She walks us through it, and it's a whole other floor of the house. There's a bedroom with its own bathroom, a little mini kitchen, and an actual sauna. But the main room of the basement is a TV room with a giant flat screen and the mushiest denim couches I've ever encountered. As soon as I sit down, I can actually feel my butt leaving an imprint. I never want to stand up. Can I get you guys something to drink? Mina tucks back a strand of hair and adjusts her glasses, and she honestly seems kind of jittery. Maybe it's weird for her, having us here. We both say no, so Mina ends up perching on the armrest of the love seat next to Cassie. And there's this extra drawn-out pause. I take one of those deep, cleansing yoga breaths Patty is so obsessed with. Slow inhale through the nose, controlled exhale through the mouth. I think it's supposed to help with childbirth, but it actually helps me now. Goal, don't be weird and awkward. So how do you know Will and Max? Cassie asks. Are they exes or... Oh God, no. Not like that. I've known them both forever. That's like us and Olivia, I say. Oh yeah, she's the tall girl with the blue hair, right? Cute, kind of curvy. Yep, Cassie says, but I can't help but wince. Like, yes, Olivia is kind of curvy and Mina didn't say it like an insult. I know it's not an insult, but I just hate when people talk about bodies. Because if Mina thinks Olivia's body is noticeably curvy, I'd like to know what she thinks about mine. No, actually, I would not like to know. Oh, Cassie says, Olivia wanted me to tell you that she's really sorry she can't make it. She's working. Aw, where does she work? One of those pottery painting places. Super Olivia-ish, Cassie says, and Mina nods. Distantly, I hear the front door open, and someone yells, Hello? We're in the basement, Mina calls. The door thuds shut, and there are footsteps on the stairs. I'm definitely nervous to see the guys again. Not because I have a crush on Will. It's just that they're both so inaccessibly cool. And when they step into the room, it's immediately confirmed. There's just something about them that looks completely right. Like they're in the right bodies. Max is vaguely muscular in an understated way, and his anime boy bangs are actually kind of nice today. Maybe. And Will basically looks like he was born inside an American apparel. He's wearing an old Ben's Chili Bowl t-shirt and jeans, and he still manages to look stupidly perfect. 
I think that's what I want. To look stupidly perfect in a t-shirt. Also, Will is holding a beer. There's a throw pillow next to me. I pick it up and hug it tightly. You guys all remember each other, right? Will Haley, Max McCone, and this is Cassie and Molly Peskin Suso. What the what? Asks Will. It's hyphenated, Cassie says. She looks up at them. You brought beer? We stole it, Will says. And I guess I must look scandalized because he turns to me and winks. Just from upstairs. Mina's dad has a beer fridge in the garage. I can't believe your parents just let you take beer whenever you want. Uh, no, but my dad is really unobservant, so... I want unobservant parents with a beer fridge, Cassie sighs. Mina grins. It's actually a kimchi fridge. And all the normal food goes in the kitchen, adds Max. Oh, really? asks Mina. Care to explain why kimchi isn't normal food? Max is like the verbal equivalent of a bull in a china shop. Will explains, settling in beside me on the couch. I can't resist sneaking a peek at him. His rumpled mess of red hair and sleepy blue eyes. He leans back and stretches, and his shirt rides all the way up, exposing his stomach, pale and flat, and dusted with light hair. I need to stop blushing. Especially because Max and Will are now exchanging what appears to be a very meaningful glance. If it is a glance about me, I will die. We are amused by the sad, chubby girl who is clearly enchanted by our hipster beauty. Seriously, I will die. I'm probably paranoid, but now I can't stop thinking about this. I get locked into this cycle sometimes. I develop counter-arguments in my head. Actually, gentlemen, I'm intrigued, not enchanted. And I'm anxious, not sad. And if you call yourself a hipster, guess what? You're not a hipster. Of course, it's possible the meaningful glance was about beer. Cassie sits up straight. Well, I hear you're an artist. Um, uh, I do photography. That counts. Cassie smiles. Molly's really artistic, too. Oh, God. Hey, that's awesome. What do you do? Will slides off the couch and settles onto the carpet, cross-legged, smiling up at me. I feel like a kindergarten teacher. If kindergartners drank beer. What do you mean? I ask. What kind of art? I shake my head quickly. I'm not artistic. I just like crafts. She makes jewelry, Mina says. Okay, they need to fucking stop. This is so mortifyingly transparent. Hey, Will, look at all the stuff Molly has in common with you. Except she actually doesn't have anything in common with you. She just thinks you're hot. That's not art, I mutter, burying my face in the throw pillow. She did all this Pinterest shit for our brother's first birthday party last month, Cassie says. It was so cute. And she does all the decorations for our birthday parties. She did the centerpieces for our binat mitzvah. Is that like a bat mitzvah? Mina asks. Yeah, like a double bat mitzvah. Or in our case, a barf mitzvah. Mina laughs. <laughs> what? Ooh, I'd like to hear this, Will says. Cassie's eyes flick to me, and she looks suddenly sheepish. Like it just occurred to her that sharing the details of my vomitous past might not help the cause. Something tells me Will won't consider it a turn-on. But it's too late. He's staring up at her, rapt. Molly, do you want to tell it? I'm not telling it. I hug my knees. Cassie shrugs. Okay, so we're up at the bima, and the rabbi's holding the Torah, and Molly and I are supposed to undress it. Whoa. Will says, and he and Max smile at each other. What? That's what they call it? Undressing the Torah? Oh my god, guys, please stop. Mina shakes her head. You're being offensive. I'm just asking. Anyway, Cassie says. The rabbi starts taking off the breastplate and the top thingies, and Molly's just standing there, looking like dead white. Like, what's his name? The vampire. Edward Cullen, I say. Yes, Edward Cullen. And I'm whispering like, 
Molly, we're supposed to be undressing the Torah, and she's like, I don't feel good. Oh no, Mina says, hand over her heart. But I'm like, okay, well, this is literally our bat mitzvah, so you're going to have to suck it up. And then I hand her the pointer. I remember this perfectly. The way the tip of the yad looked like a hand, with a tiny little metallic pointer finger. I used to think the yad was adorable. But when Cassie extended it toward me in that moment, it felt like an accusation. You, Molly, you. I remember the sudden sensation of bile burning the back of my throat, the tidal wave in my stomach. And she's like... Cassie clutches her stomach, making gagging noises. And she jets out of there. She runs down the stairs and out the side door, and everyone's like, oh, holy shit. It's totally silent. And then you could just hear these insane puking sounds going on for like 20 minutes. Okay, it was not 20 minutes. Seriously, this, this is how Cassie's going to convince Will to make out with me. It was 20 minutes, and at first we're all like, oh shit, she barfed in the lobby of the synagogue, because, you know, we can hear it. Oh god, Mina says. But then, Cassie raises a finger. I remember. She taps her collarbone. We're wearing microphones. No. Oh, Molly. Mina looks at me. Oh my god, that is just... I'm sorry, but can I hug you? I nod, and she actually slides down from her perch on the love seat. She actually hugs me. That sucks, she says. I'm so sorry. And then I chanted my entire Torah portion without missing a single syllable. Cassie announces smugly. Yeah, well, I wrinkle my nose at her. You know what I love about Jewish people? Max says. He looks so different when he smiles. His face lights up entirely. Mina side-eyes him. What? I love that you have your bar mitzvah in front of your parents and grandparents and everyone. And like, that's the Jewish version of becoming a woman. He leans forward, grinning. But in my religion, you are not religious, Mina says. In my religion? He repeats emphatically. You become a woman by... He forms an O with his left hand and pokes through it with his right pointer finger again and again and again. Jesus Christ, Max, stop it. I'm serious. Mina stands up. Yeah, that's pretty fucking problematic, Cassie says calmly. What? Max looks wounded. How is that problematic? The Jewish thing? Um, let's start with the implication that becoming a woman has anything to do with whether or not you've had sex. I have to admit, my sister is a badass. She just doesn't get intimidated by people. I don't know how to be like that. Oh, jeez, okay. I was kidding. Max sighs. And you know what? I'm pretty much done with this whole construct of virginity. Cassie does air quotes. Which I'm sure you think applies to heterovaginal sex. You think a person can lose their virginity from oral sex? Yes, Cassie says. Max, seriously. Mina glares down at him. Okay, but don't you think it depends on the couple? Will chimes in. It's like a case-by-case -case thing. Like, if oral is the end game for a particular couple, then yeah. But if it's like a hetero guy and girl, I think there would have to be penetration. But why? Cassie leans forward. Why would that be considered more intimate than oral? Like, why do you get to decide what makes something intimate? I lean back against the cushions and tuck my feet up under my thighs. It's even worse than the bikini wax conversation. I feel so out of my league. I don't know. This is not the kind of sex talk I'm used to having. I'm not saying the concepts are new to me. I mean, Patty's a midwife, and she can get very specific about these things. But that's strictly informational mom stuff. And when Abby talks about sex, it's about the feelings, not the orifices. But I feel like we're jumping straight into orifices. Will nudges me. What do you think? And the whole room goes silent. At least, that's how it feels. I mean, he has to know I'm the last person he should be consulting about this. 
I'm pretty much the latest blooming icon of teen purity to ever exist outside a Judd Apatow movie. Literally, the only penetration in my life involves monofilament cord and paper beads. To be honest, I am Queen Elizabeth. I'm the Virgin Queen. And I think I know how she'd handle this conversation. She would observe and remain silent. Of course, Elizabeth probably didn't have a room full of hipster sex gods staring her down. I mean, I think people have this mentality that sex is only real if it involves a penis, Cassie says finally. Oh my god, Mina sighs. Thank you. This is like my soapbox. She and Cassie beam at each other. And on that note, Will announces loudly, I'm getting another beer. He springs up from the carpet, and Mina murmurs something to Cassie under her breath. Then Cassie laughs and whispers something back to Mina. And for a minute, I'm just sitting there, across from Max, who glances up at me for a moment, before deciding his phone is more interesting than I am. So maybe Max is one of those guys who only wants to befriend girls he thinks are hot. See also, guys who wear fedoras. See also, guys who say, no fatties. Though maybe I'm being too sensitive. Cassie tells me this a lot. Anyway, I feel a little better when Will slides back onto the couch beside me, lips pressed against the rim of his beer bottle like he's kissing it. He takes a quick sip, tilts his head toward me. So, have you ever thought about doing photography? Oh, um, not really. Molly, you totally should, Cassie says. You know, you guys should hang out and work on a project together or something. Oh my god. I feel sick. I actually feel sick. My sister is the least subtle person on the planet. This is so much worse than the Barf Mitzvah story. I don't care about the Barf Mitzvah story. But this... He's going to think I want to hook up with him. That I'm in love with him. That I'm obsessed with him. And I'm sorry, but there's a reason I'm so careful. Boys like Will don't like girls like me. And if they find out we like them, they are always cruel. Always. I need to breathe. In through the nose. How through the mouth. So you have to hear the new Florence and the Machine album. Mina says, I have it upstairs on my laptop. It's so great. Max looks up suddenly, turning to Will. Dude, we gotta go. Come on. Wait, what? I want to hear Florence. I'm sure it's on YouTube, Max says. And I'm your ride, so... You're a dickhole, McCone. Max shakes his keys, and then, to my utter surprise, he turns to me with one of those face-lighting smiles. Need a ride to the Metro, Molly? So maybe I was wrong about the fedora and the no fatties. Um, yeah, thank you. That would be really great. I look at Cassie. Cass, you ready? There's this pause. Um, I'm gonna stay and hear that album. Is that okay? I feel a tiny twinge low in my chest. Yeah, yeah, totally. I pause. So, do you want me to stay, or... Oh, no, it's fine, Cassie says quickly. You should go. Mina nods. I can drop Cassie off after. Oh. I think this is how it happens. Okay, yeah. I say again, trying to sound casual. Suddenly, there's this pressure building behind my eyes. But it's probably just excitement or adrenaline because I'm not a shitty person. If my sister wants to make out with this girl, I would like this make out to proceed as planned. And if it means I have to ride the metro with two cute boys, so be it. I should be excited about this, right? Not one, two. Two cute hipster boys. Max leads the way upstairs, and already I know what this ride will be like. The boys will be jokey and knowing and familiar, and I will lose myself to shyness. I will be the ice cube. Will isn't drunk, exactly, but he's sort of loose and happy. He curses Max out for making him leave, but you can tell he's not actually mad at all. Whereas Max just looks amused all the way to his car. 
So where do you have to be so fucking urgently? Will asks, sliding into the passenger seat. I tuck into the back seat, shutting the door quietly behind me. A part of me wonders if they remember I'm here. Seatbelt, Max says. Will clicks his seatbelt on. If you're not buckled, we're not moving. Max explains, twisting around to check my status. I'm buckled. I show him. Kind of funny and endearing, actually. Max is the last person I'd expect to care about seatbelts. I'm not sure I understand him. I definitely don't understand these two as a unit. At first, I thought Will was essentially the alpha guy, since he talks more. But now, I don't know. Because Max has this intensity. It makes me kind of nervous. You didn't answer my question, Will says, poking Max's arm. I don't have to be anywhere. I'm just following orders. He passes Will his phone. Oh, shit, Will says. Max laughs. And I feel like I'm missing something. Are they hooking up? I ask slowly. Well, Mina asked us to clear out, so... Max says. He starts the car and glances at me in the mirror. Red line okay? That's great. Thanks. My head is kind of spinning. So Mina planned this. I guess she texted Max when we were all in the room together. And now the boys and I have been exiled. She and Cassie are probably making out right now. Literally right now. And because I'm not a shitty person, I'm 100% thrilled. 8. And now Cassie's being mysterious, and it's really fucking weird. Normally, when she hooks up with someone, she's bursting with the details. She's a kiss and teller. Maybe that's awful, but it's just a part of the hookup process for her. She told me once that a kiss isn't a kiss until she tells me about it. Me, specifically. I loved hearing that. And I guess I'm the same way with my crushes. Talking about them with Cassie makes them real. But there's something happening, and I swear I'm not imagining it. Ever since Wednesday, she's been so twinkly, smiling out of nowhere and listening to that Florence album constantly. But she hasn't mentioned Mina. At all. And it feels wrong asking for details. I've never had to ask before. Then I wake up on Friday to Cassie's face staring down at me. Oh my God, I say, sitting up abruptly. Wake up, let's make breakfast. I rub my eyelids and sweep my bangs off my face. Give me one second. She counts to one. If she wasn't my twin, I'd swear she was nine years old. I have literally never seen her so bright-eyed. Her hair is pulled up high on her head, and she's wearing pink pajama pants, and I'd expect this level of bubbliness from Abby. From Cassie, it's just weird. I follow her to the kitchen, trying to be quiet on the stairs. Our house is this 102-year-old bungalow, and when you're trying not to wake your moms, it's essentially a giant booby trap. Creaky doors, creaky stairs, creaky everything, and a sleep-averse little brother with supernaturally good hearing. Cassie's an awful cook, so I take the lead. I have to admit, I like being needed. She hooks her phone up to our little speaker, and there's that Florence and the Machine album again. But she won't say Mina's name. She just keeps opening and shutting cabinets, moving between the kitchen and dining room, setting out plates and folding napkins, all in this happy kind of daze. And yes, it's but early, and maybe she's just zoned out. But still, she should not leave me hanging. This is a flagrant violation of every code of twinship. I'm just about to swallow my pride and become, as Abby calls it, Mademoiselle nosy as fuck, except then Xavier ruins everything by waking up in a burst of full-volume babble. Our mom's room is above the dining room, so we can hear thudding footsteps and murmuring and the bathroom door shutting. Nadine always starts the day by nursing Zave, so Patty's the first to come down. And it's funny. Patty's as wild-eyed as Cassie. For a moment, I wonder if Cassie talked to her first. But she wouldn't. She would never. I'm the person Cassie talks to about girls. I mean, 
I'm the one Cassie talks to about everything. I think. That smells amazing, Patty says, smoothing my hair. Nadine walks in with Xavier a moment later. Holy mother of deliciousness, what is this? Proof that we have the best kids in the universe. Nadine hands Xavier off to Patty, beaming. So you guys saw the news. Cassie and I look at each other. No, I say finally. What? Nadine yelps. You people are supposed to be teenagers. Go look at the internet right now. She's smiling so widely, I can't help but smile back. Something's happening. Cassie's already scrolling through her phone, and she gasps. My phone's charging in the wall outlet. I tug the cord out and unlock my screen. Where should I look? Anywhere. Patty smiles. Go to Facebook, Cassie says. I tap into my Facebook app, and my heart skips. Scrolling through, it's all rainbows. Literally every single person on my feed is talking about the same thing. Is this for real? I say softly. Yes! Nadine grins up at me from across the table. Amazing, right? I mean, I knew the Supreme Court would be voting about same-sex marriage, but I managed to put it out of my mind. I guess I didn't expect it to go well. But, holy shit, it went well. It's legal everywhere. I can't believe this. I know, Patty says. She glances at Nadine. So, actually, we have some news. Oh, my God. Cassie claps her hands together. Patty and Nadine look at each other again. And when they smile at each other, it's like they're our age. Suddenly, I can almost picture how they must have looked when they first met, which was years and years ago, when Patty was a grad student at Maryland and Nadine was an undergrad. It's bizarre to think about this. I mean, there's literally nothing weirder than imagining your parents falling in love. But Patty and Nadine just keep smiling at each other. So we're getting married, Nadine says. Shut up! Cassie jumps out of her seat, grinning so hard I think her face might split apart. You're getting married? I ask. There's a lump in my throat. I look over at Patty, and her face is almost completely buried in Xavier's hair. I think she might be about to cry. And we want you to be our maids of honor, Nadine adds. Holy shit, Cassie says. Oh my god, this is so awesome. There's going to be a wedding? Like the most epic, awesome wedding of all time, Nadine says. Momo, you're our DIY girl, right? Did you pick a date? Cassie asks. Where are we doing this? This summer. Our backyard. Whatever. We're doing this. Nadine clasps her hands together. Finally. Finally. I agree. It's funny. I didn't think they ever would. I guess because they could have two years ago in Maryland. But Nadine was pregnant at the time, and Patty was switching jobs, and they didn't even bring it up. Are you guys up for this maid of honor gig? It's a big responsibility, Nadine says. Because I'm warning you now, we're gonna be bridezillas. Big time zillas, says Patty. Oh man, I'm so excited, Cassie says. Your bastard children are very happy for you. Oh my god, we won't be bastards anymore, I say. Oh, you guys will always be our bastards. Now I don't want to go to work, I say. We should celebrate. Nah, go do your thing. You gotta bring home the dough, and we'll have family dinner tonight, Nadine says. I'll walk with you, says Cassie. I can't help but grin. Maybe she's about to tell me everything. Maybe things are normal after all. Maybe they're better than normal. It's beautiful outside. The summer heat hasn't set in yet. It's just sunny with a few cotton ball clouds. It's early, but lots of people are awake. I see our across-the-street neighbor out pinning up a giant rainbow flag, and farther down the street, someone's playing Uptown Funk. It feels like a holiday. Okay, how excited are you? Cassie asks, bouncing on the balls of her feet. Because I'm, like, really fucking excited. I know. 
Like, I didn't think I'd care this much because it's not like they were less of a couple two days ago, but I'm just happy, you know? I giggle and nod. It's just been a really amazing week, she says, sighing, which feels like a door nudging open. Yeah, about that, I say. I feel my lips curving upward. Hmm? She's grinning. I'm just saying, I'd like to know more about some of the other amazing things that happened this week. She laughs. Yeah. But she doesn't say more. I give her an elbow nudge and finally say it. Are you seriously not going to tell me what happened with Mina? With Mina? She asks calmly. Totally, perfectly, utterly calmly. And now I'm confused. Maybe I misinterpreted. Maybe Cassie and Mina didn't hook up at all. Maybe I'm an asshole for assuming they did. As if girls who like girls can't be friends without falling for each other. It's just that it seemed like they were falling for each other. If you were in love, you'd tell me, right? In love? She laughs again. Uh, maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves? I stare her down. She wrinkles her nose and grins at me, and I can't help but grin back. I just like to live vicariously through you, I say. But it's the beginning of a new era, she says. Now we live vicariously through Nadine and Patty. That is weird and sad. But they're getting married, Cassie sighs again. This is the awesomest thing that's ever happened to us. When I get to work, there's this charge in the air, even though the store isn't open to customers yet. Deborah and Ari are completely amped up. Molly! Deborah calls over the music, which is maybe three times as loud as usual. Get over here! You heard the news, right? She's leaning next to the register, arms draped over the counter, beaming. I get this hot chocolate feeling in my stomach, cozy and content. I love this day, and I love this job. And Reed should be here any minute, too. Exciting stuff, right? Ari says when I get to the register. Yeah, I smile up at them. My mom's got engaged. Oh, sweetie, that's wonderful. I didn't even know. Jeez, you should take the day off and celebrate. Deborah squeezes my hand. No, it's fine. I like being here. You are such a gem, kiddo. Are you sure? Definitely, I say, nodding quickly. Deborah smiles. Well, that would actually be great. Reed has an eye doctor appointment, so we can definitely use you. I feel strangely deflated. But Deborah and Ari put me in charge of a rainbow display at the front of the store, which is literally the most satisfying task I could ever be assigned. I get to pull stuff from other displays and place them in an entirely new context. A vintage red-painted tea kettle, an orange ceramic owl, a yellow tablecloth, green mason jars, a blue repurposed picture frame, and, of course, an eggplant onesie from the baby section. Seriously, Molly, you have such an eye for this. Are your moms recruiting you for wedding decor? I laugh. Yup. Smart women, she says. Let me know if there's anything from the store they can use. Or you can come over if you want and I can help you make stuff. As long as you're not allergic to cats. I love cats. Deborah laughs. Well, we have five of them which means Reed has five cats. Somehow, I'm not surprised to hear this. Okay, so maybe this is random, but I once developed a crush on a guy for cat-related reasons. Crush number 20. Vihan of the cutest contraband. He was a trans guy from the Spectrum Club I went to with Cassie, and he always wore this hoodie with a kangaroo pouch in front. I never really thought about why. But then one day, there was a kitten in the pouch, Vihan literally carried a kitten in the pouch of his hoodie for an entire school day, and his teachers never noticed. But when he saw me staring, he lifted the kitty out of his pouch and placed her in my arms. And our hands touched, and he looked at me with these twinkly brown eyes like we were both in on a joke. And he had really, really unforgettably gorgeous eyes. Anyway, have I mentioned I love cats? I spend the rest of the morning stacking and arranging ceramic dishes and scented candles and thinking about weddings. 
there really is a dreaminess about today. Even our customers seem unusually coupled up. They're all holding hands. It's like a Valencia-filtered Noah's Ark. And it's nice. Except, sometimes I feel like I'm the last alone person. Like, maybe there aren't seven and a half billion people in the world. Maybe there are seven and a half billion and one. I'm the one. Though I have a theory. Kind of a fucked up theory. But it's been poking around my brain since the day Mina and Cassie hooked up. Or didn't hook up. This is going to sound weird, but I think I need to be rejected. I think I need it like I need a flu shot. Or like those therapists who make you hold snakes until you're not afraid of snakes anymore. I don't even know if that makes sense. But I spend a lot of time thinking about love and kissing and boyfriends and all the other stuff feminists aren't supposed to care about. And I am a feminist. But I don't know. I'm 17, and I just want to know what it feels like to kiss someone. I don't think I'm unlovable. But I keep wondering, what is my glitch? My moms are getting married. My sister might be secretly hooking up with someone. Abby moved to Georgia and got a cute guitar-playing boyfriend within months. Even Olivia and Evan Schulmeister make it happen. They actually met in the camp infirmary. The girl had pink eye, and she still had more game than me. And all these couples wandering through the store right now. The guys holding hands while they flip through cookbooks. The pair of grandparents asking Ari for recommendations in the baby section. It's not like they're all epic hotties with six-packs. They're just normal people. But I can't seem to get there. And I can't shake this thought. I've had crushes on 26 people, 25 of whom are not Lin-Manuel Miranda, 23 of whom are age-appropriate, real-life, viable crush objects, 18 of whom were definitely single and interested in girls at the time of my crush. And I never even tried. Not even with the ones who talked to me first. So maybe I should let my heart break just to prove that my heart can take it. Or at the very least... I need to stop being so fucking careful. 9. All the way home, I'm breathless just thinking about it. Operation Be Less Careful. Operation Stop Worrying About Rejection. Operation It's Good For Me. I can't decide if I should tell Cassie about my revelation or not. It's not like it changes anything. She's still going to try to push me together with hipster will. And she's still going to be mortifyingly unsubtle about it. I guess the only difference is I'm going along with it. I hear Nadine and Cassie clanging around the kitchen, laughing and murmuring and opening drawers. I guess Nadine's pretty serious about tonight being a family dinner. I mean, we usually eat dinner together, but every so often it's a family dinner, which basically means cloth napkins, and the meal being planned out ahead of time. Probably most people go to restaurants for this kind of thing, but we haven't done that much since Xavier was born. I head down to help. Nadine's in the kitchen, squirting juice all over a chicken, and Cassie's stirring a bowl of something. So I set the table, and we all settle in, and Nadine lifts a glass of champagne. All right, here's a toast. To us. To marriage to a totally awesome Peskin Suso wedding in the very near future. We all toast. With champagne, because our moms are cool like that. Except for Xavier, because our moms are not that cool. Xavier toasts with milk. So we're thinking mid to late July. Of this year? I ask. Yep. Patty smiles up at me. She's cutting chicken into tiny pieces for Zave. You can't plan a wedding that fast. They are nuts. I'm sorry, but it's true. You need to sample cakes and order your dress and plan your decor, which takes time. I'm serious. And then you have to talk to caterers, photographers, florists, seamstresses, DJs, and a million other people. I may know a little too much about this. I may be a little more familiar with wedding blogs than your average single 17-year-old girl. Why not? Patty asks. Because. I shake my head. You just can't. You have a lot to get ready. You need at least a year. 
Momo, I think you're thinking of the royal wedding. Okay, first of all, Will and Kate weren't even engaged that long. Good, there you go, Nadine says. Will and Kate, that's how we roll. I start to protest, but Patty smiles up at me. Sweetie, we're just doing a backyard wedding. Mostly family. Oh, right. But you guys can bring friends if you want. What about dates? Cassie asks. Ooh, do you have something to tell us, kitty cat? Nadine grins and Patty presses her hand to her heart, and their expressions are just like they were on the night of our barf mitzvah when Cassie slow danced with Jenna Schenker. Okay, please don't make that face. You guys are as bad as Molly. We created Molly, Nadine says. We made her bad. She leans forward, brushing my bangs aside. So tell us about her, Patty says. Cassie bites back a smile. What's her name? Mina. What's she like? Nadine asks. Awesome. Yeah, I got that. But okay, if this is your first real girlfriend, kitty cat, I'm gonna need details. Cassie raises and wrinkles her eyebrows. I didn't say she was my girlfriend. She's not? All I'm saying is that I met her. Nadine smiles. And she's awesome. And she's hilarious and cool and pretty and kind of hipster, but not too hipster, I chime in. And I like her. Oh, so Molly's met her? Nadine turns to me. Hold up. Now I really want the details. Well, Cass hasn't told me anything, I say, and it comes out sharp. I don't mean for that to happen, but it does. I feel suddenly off kilter, like my limbs don't know how to act. I guess I'm the tiniest bit pissed off, because it kind of feels like Cassie's teasing us. She wants us to know something happened with Mina. She just doesn't want us to know what. It's like those people who post vague, attention-grabby Facebook statuses. Whoa, something huge is happening this weekend, lol. Cannot believe you would do something like this. I will never forgive you. God will never forgive you. You will probably burn in hell, but no hard feelings. Cassie and I live for these statuses. I just never thought she would become one of these statuses. You'd like her, Cassie says finally. She's really cool and funny, and she knows a lot about music, and she loves fish. Not like to eat, like as animals. She's really into aquariums. Cassie adds, she has a French angelfish tattoo. Did you know the French angelfish is monogamous? Oh, and she likes penguins. Mina likes all monogamous animals. Sounds like she's a romantic, Patty says. I guess so. When I glance up, Cassie's looking at me with an expression I can't read. And now I can't sleep. Not even close, though it's practically midnight. Cassie's hanging out with Mina at some party. I feel so twitchy and strange and too hot and too cold. I'm reading my phone in bed, trying to ignore this suffocating feeling, but it's not working. I feel like I'm drowning in it. I sit up suddenly, and then I stand up all the way. Because this is stupid. This is ridiculous. I'm taking my laptop and I'm going downstairs. I'm extra quiet in front of Zave's room, and I do my best not to creak on every step. There are yogurt-covered raisins in a container on the kitchen counter, so I bring them to the couch. But I don't even feel like watching TV. I don't feel like doing anything. I don't even know what I need right now. I just want to feel normal. I open my computer and start clicking through some of the wedding blogs, most of which are very hazy and twinkly and dreamy and rustic. And I have to admit... It's soothing. Just something about the taste of yogurt raisins and professional photos of pies arranged on bookcases. We should definitely do pies on bookcases. And also one of those do-it-yourself photo backdrops. Maybe something simple, like a patterned piece of fabric and some distressed wooden picture frames. I should probably start pinning this stuff. Momo, why are you still awake? I look up, and it's Nadine, wearing pajama pants and a t-shirt and this striped robe thing. She's disheveled and sleepy-looking, and she keeps poking at the corners of her eyes. I must have woken her up. I'm sorry. Honey, what's up? 
She gestures for me to scoot down on the couch, and she slides in next to me. What's... are you looking at wedding blogs? Possibly. Man, you're hardcore. She reaches out to tuck my bangs away from my eyes. Hey, you okay? Huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mom, I'm fine. She's quiet for a moment. And then she stands up. Come on, let's go for a drive. You and me. What? Yep, let's go. I just need some coffee. Um, it's midnight. Correct. I'm wearing pajamas. So am I. She grins down at me. Momo, come on. Stop making the molly face. Just trust me. It feels entirely surreal to be wearing pajama pants and sneakers, walking out to Nadine's car at midnight like we're sneaking out of the house. It's warm, even this late, and there's that buzzing insect sound that Patty says is cicadas. Nadine opens the car with her clicker, and I settle into the passenger seat. And then she backs out of the driveway extra slowly, like she's worried about pedestrians, but the streets are totally empty. Where are we going? You'll see. She's staring straight ahead, one hand on the steering wheel, one hand on her coffee mug, but she's grinning. I relax into my seat, taking everything in. The street lights, the porch swings, and the way my neighbors' houses seem to loom in the darkness. The Applebaum's cat stares at us through their living room window like the little creeper he is, and then he runs to another window to try to keep up with us. But we keep driving, onto Piney Branch, onto 16th Street, and we're quiet, but it actually feels nice. We're almost at Adams Morgan by the time Nadine finally says something. So, how are you doing, kiddo? Good, I say. She shakes her head. You are such a little faker. What? It's weird, right? Cassie having a girlfriend? She's not technically her girlfriend. Nadine grins. I give it a week. That makes me laugh but there's also this sad sort of tug in my chest. Yeah, it's weird, I say. I know. Oh, man, Momo, this is a tough one. She nods, still looking at the road. You know, growing up, my brother was such a dickwad, but your Aunt Karen and I were really close, and I remember this. I remember when she got a boyfriend and she just fell off the grid. It sucked. Yeah. And no one warns you about this. No one tells you how hard it is because, yay, love, and we're so happy for them. But there's this sharp edge to it, right? Because, yeah, you're happy for them, but you've also lost them. My heart twists. I can't speak. But, Mo, they come back to us, you know? You roll with it. It's weird for a while, but they come back. You'll get her back. I tuck my knees up and stare out the window. We're almost at DuPont, heading downtown. And there are so many people out. There's this palpable energy in the air. It's the kind of night where strangers start hugging and everyone's drunk and loud and happy just to be in the middle of all of this. I bet people will remember today, even when they're old. I bet I will, too. Pretty wild, Nadine says. Yeah, I nod. And suddenly, I feel like crying, but not in a bad way. More like in the way you feel when someone gives you a perfect present, something you'd been wanting but thought you couldn't ask for. It's that feeling of someone knowing you in all the ways you needed to be known. Hey, she says softly, look. I look up, straight ahead, and I recognize it immediately from five million Facebook posts. It's the White House, lit up with rainbow lights. And it takes my breath away. Even though it's far away, even though we'd have to pass a million cars to get close to the actual house, I don't even think it's the front of the building. But still. Really cool, huh? I nod, feeling choked up. Just wanted to see it in person, she says. I'm so happy about it, I tell her. Suddenly, it feels so important to say that. And I'm so happy about the wedding. Well, good. Because we need someone trolling wedding blogs at midnight. Oh, I'm on that. I smile. 
But seriously, I'm just so glad this is happening. Me too, Nadine says, turning left onto a one-way. You know what I think? What? I think this is going to be a really great summer for our family. Me too, I say, and I try to believe it. 10. But here's the piece I can't quite shake. Nadine said they come back. That we'll be normal again. Cassie and me. And I get that. I mean, Abby came down to earth after Daryl. And Nick hasn't ruined us. Love doesn't kill friendship. It definitely doesn't kill family. Except it sort of does, doesn't it? Because we almost never see my Aunt Karen. Because she's not Nadine's main person anymore. I think she used to be. But Nadine's main person is Patty. And I don't know when that happened. Maybe this is how it starts. Anyway, somehow Mina's coming for dinner on Wednesday, despite the fact that my grandma's coming in from New York that day. Patty's mom also known as the grandma who hits people with her car and then calls them bitches. So I'm pretty sure this is going to be a shit show. Like, a major, epic shit show. But even though Cassie gave this plan a solid nope a week ago, today she seems really zen about it. It's like she's so focused on the Mina coming for dinner part that she's forgotten all about the with grandma part. The thing about Grandma is that she doesn't always have a filter. So this should be interesting. I'm in charge of dessert. I spend all weekend thinking about it, looking up recipes and waking up at three in the morning wondering if Mina has gluten allergies or diabetes. Though there's no way Cassie would have forgotten to mention this. I'm pretty sure there's nothing Mina-related in the world she's forgotten to mention. But oh, I'm so wrong. Because on Monday, I get an Abby text with about five million exclamation points. No words, no emojis, just undiluted punctuational excitement. And at first, I assume it's some new development with Nick, which throws me for a loop. Because once sex has already happened, what could be worthy of five million exclamation points? Like, I don't think that's how she'd break the news if she were pregnant. I hope not. Anyway, I figured it out pretty quickly when Abby follows up with, Why didn't you tell me about Cass? What are you talking about? Um, go check Facebook. Now. So I tap into the app and go straight to Cassie's page, which she never updates. Ever. But she did. In a relationship. With Mina Choi. I cradle my phone in my hand and just stare at it. She seriously didn't tell you? Abby writes. WTF is wrong with her? No idea, I write. She didn't tell me. Cassie's in a real-life relationship with Mina, and she didn't tell me. I found out on Facebook. I'm Cassie's twin sister, and I found out on Facebook. Do your moms know? No idea, I write back. But she's coming for dinner on Wednesday. Whoa! Cassie! Introducing her to the folks! And Grandma, I add. OMFG! Your Grandma Betty? Yep. I add that emoji with a big, toothy, grimacing smile. LOL! Should be quite a night! Which makes me smile a little bit. I decide to make homemade edible cookie dough. When I tell Reed about it at work, he seems both impressed and confused. But how is regular cookie dough not edible? He asks. We're in the back room, unboxing new inventory. Well, it has raw eggs. Oh, okay. He nods, but a moment later, he frowns. And you're not supposed to eat raw eggs? Reed, no! I mean... I know you're not supposed to eat them raw, but what if they're mixed in with stuff? I side-eye him hard. You know they're still raw, right? I know, but they're neutralized by the other ingredients. 
That is not how eggs work. I bite back a smile. I think you just have to try the egg-free kind. It's really good, I promise. He leans backward on his palms and seems to consider this for a moment. Finally, he nods. Okay, I approve. Whew. I stretch forward, pulling the last box toward me. We actually timed this well. We'll get the last stuff unboxed right at the end of the workday.